So one of the things that we're going to talk about is going to be the different phyla, uh, excuse me, the different classes uh, of the phyla platyhemethes. And so there are four big classes. So we have class Turbillaria. These are going to be free-living uh, flatworms, so ones that are non-parasitic. Uh, the rest are all parasitic, but we have monogenians, which are external parasites. We have trematodas and cystoideas, which are internal parasites. So the trematodes are internal flukes, and then the cystoids are uh, tapeworms, essentially. So let's talk about class Turbillaria. So these are going to be our free-living flatworms. Um, so we do have marine and freshwater, both in Turbillaria. And they're simply named Turbillaria because a lot of times they have little cilia that are on them or on their sides that they'll use to help push themselves through the water and it causes kind of turbulence. Uh, also with the marine flatworms specifically, you can actually see they actually undulate through the water as they move and they, uh, uh, it causes a little bit of turbulence, but you can definitely see they almost look like they're flying, like flying carpets through the water is kind of what they look like. Um, so even though they are free living, most of these are bottom dwellers, especially in the marine species. They just crawl along the bottom and eat what they can, either detritus or scavenge or, or maybe to eat, eat some algae colonies or whatever have you, whatever they want to eat. Um, there are a few that are terrestrial, but they have to live in the tropic areas where it's warm and it has to be kind of humid there, so that way they, they don't dry out. There's over 3,000 species total in the Turbillaria, area, um, uh, and again, a good portion of these are marine. And the easiest way to tell the marine ones, marine, marine worms are actually very, very colorful uh, and very pretty to look at. So they can be anywhere from 1 centimeter to 30 centimeters in length. And the high, most highly studied individual of Turbillaria area is Dungesia, uh, which is a freshwater planarian. So probably like when you were back in like, I don't know, fifth grade, you may have used some like plastic... Um, microscopes and with a little slide underneath it you know you're kind of like my first uh, my first microscope and uh, you've probably looked at these guys and one of the reasons why is um, this is a highly studied species because of one of the properties that they have which is the the ability for fragmentation so remember we looked at uh, um, asexual reproduction we said fragmentation is a way they can reproduce this is the quintessential example if you cut the head off the head will grow into a body and the body will grow into a head and then you'll have two and so that is technically a way to reproduce um, you can actually split these lengthwise down the middle and uh, each half will grow back the, the missing half so you'll have one worm with two heads it's actually pretty cool um, so you may have heard of these before so these carry out pretty much the same uh, anatomy that we've already looked at so there may be some things that are repeated but I don't think repeating anything is really going to hurt you um, but just in general, they do have a, uh, the, the eye spots, the ocelli, the auricles, they have the, the, the gastro and, and um, vascular cavity on the inside. Here's a really good example of those uh, transverse and the longitudinal uh, nerve cords. Um, one thing I want to point out is, is this. So a lot of people think, well, wouldn't the mouth be towards the front? Well, on these guys, they're not. And the reason why is this pattern that you see looks like it's a pattern on the skin. This is not actually the skin. You're actually seeing through the skin. This is the this is essentially their stomach. I know it's very highly branched, and that's okay. Um, it's how they're able to get nutrients to all of the cells. They don't have a circulatory system, so they can't pump anything anywhere. So essentially, their stomach just extends all over the place to help uh, get nutrients to the inside. But they have what's called a pharynx. So we have a pharynx. It's the back part of our throat. And it's attached to our mouth and connects our mouth to our esophagus, which is, does a bunch of different things. Um, but they don't have a mouth. They, well, they do have a mouth. They have an opening. But they don't have a jaw. So their pharynx just extends like a tube and essentially would suck up particles that, they, that they're going to eat and ingest. And this just pulls back into their body and extends out whenever they're, they're feeding, uh, which is neat to look at. So... It's a lot of stuff I just mentioned, uh, small invertebrates, they eat herbivores or eat algae, um, that's cool. So uh, they do have uh, receptors called chemoreceptors, and those chemoreceptors are just, they pick up on chemical uh, signals, so like our nose does. Um, essentially, if they're trying to find prey, they can follow it by picking up on the chemicals, the, the chemical trail that it leaves behind. Or um, maybe if there, there's some predator around, they'll be able to sense it, sense it since the chemo, use the chemoreceptors to sense its chemical trail. Uh, there's the gastrovascular cavity. You can see it here in the purple. 
like we mentioned before, it's highly branched. And there's our pharynx, the muscular tube that extends out and simply just uh, uh, pulls food into the gut where it's digested and then the digestion pieces just go around into all the different chambers which helps get nutrients to all of the internal cells. So for locomotion, um, so they have cilia on their epidermal cells, so their outer cells, um, and that helps them just glide through the water. Uh, they do have some muscle layers that, that help reach, uh, um, uh, reach from the top part of their body down to the bottom part of their body. And essentially, whereas I hear the dorsoventral muscles, they're what help keep a flat worm flat. So they pull the dorsal down towards the ventral, so the back down towards the belly and help keep it flat. Because remember, they rely on diffusion for, this, for, their, uh, uh, for uh, exchange of oxygen and some uh, excretion. Um, so they have to stay flat for that to happen. If they were thick, and rounded, then the cells in the middle will be further away from the cells on the outside, and, and that type of diffusion would be harder. Now that again, they do have flame cells, and they do have excretory system, uh, but they still rely to some degree on uh, the, that uh, diffusion. So they do have muscle cells that, that are controlled by the nerves, and it helps them to twist and turn, and they can actually pretty rapidly respond to uh, stimuli in their environment, which is nice for being able to like run away from a predator that's trying to eat you. Like we said before, they do have the excretion. So looking a little bit more closely at it, there is a thing called a protonephridia. So nephridia means a little kidney. So in like a nephron, it's, it has to do with like a kidney cell. So uh, nephridia means little kidney. A protonephridia is essentially a very, very uh, uh, basic form of a little kidney. Uh, and that forms a series of tubes all around their body. Uh, those flame cells, like we mentioned earlier, helps create a current that pushes out things like nitrates and other things they're trying to excrete. Um, and those tubes do merge together and do uh, to a, a, a and will connect to an opening to the outside called an ephridia pore, which just is a spot like their pee hole essentially, uh, and it just helps get rid of that cellular waste to the outside environment. And this is important because our system, our excretory system, with our kidneys and our bladder and uh, the filtration that we do uh, to help get toxins out of our system is, is essentially based upon uh, just a more advanced design to this system. And this is kind of where it all started. So we mentioned with their nervous system, we, they do have the cerebral ganglia, they do have the longitudinal nerve cores, the oracles, and the ocelli. There's one extra thing I want to point out that uh, the turbal areas have that aren't necessarily always found in other types of flatworms, which are mechanoreceptors. So a mechanoreceptor essentially allows the, uh, the, the worm to determine is, is there some, they sense pressure. So if a fish or something swims by, and, it, and its tail flicks, and that pushes the water. A pressure wave of water will go by and hit the planarian, and uh, hit the planarian, hit the um, hit the flatworm, and you'll be able to tell, hey, there's something off to that side. So they sense pressure. Um, essentially, they can sense gravity. If you flip this worm over onto its back, it would know to right itself uh, because it can detect it can detect how its body is standing in relation to gravity, and it knows kind of. I need to put my back towards the top and my, my bed, you know, my belly towards the bottom. So that's really neat. That's, that's this something that they have that not everything else has. Um, so for reproduction for these guys, they can go through budding, they can go through fission, they can go through fragmentation. They can also reproduce sexually, some of the species, so they can be, they, when they do, they are monoecious. Um, so they're both male and female, so they're hematherites. Uh, they are going to lay eggs, and those eggs are usually in a cluster, um, but since they're laying eggs, they're oviparous. Um, we call that cluster a cocoon. Uh, it usually takes a couple weeks for the cocoons to hash depending on the species and other things like water temperature and pH of the environment and all that other fun stuff. Uh, and then they have this little wonderful thing they call penal fencing. There is a video in the links on Canvas, and one of them is called penal fencing. I encourage you to please go watch that so you'll understand how a how how when two flatworms, especially marine flatworms, when two marine flatworms meet together, how do they determine which one's going to be the father and which one's going to be the mother? Because they're both hermaphrodites and they actually don't inseminate each other. One of them becomes a female, the other one, well, one of them will become the mother, rather, and the other one is the father. And the video actually does a really good job explaining why that is.